Hello and welcome back. In this video we will discuss the power transform and that is a whole family of transformations we can try to apply to the data. And this family is indexed by one parameter which is the exponent. We're taking powers of the data which gives the transformation its name and we will discuss a bit how that exponent can be chosen in a rational way. Okay, so let's see what we can do. Good, so in this section I'm going to discuss something which is for historical reasons called the power transform. I would probably call it the power transformation if it was me. And let me start by just writing the rule. So it's again turning y values into transformed y values. And the rule is the transformed y, I write y lambda because there's a parameter lambda in the transformation. That is most of the time y to the lambda shifted a bit and scaled a bit. And that is for all lambda different from zero. And if lambda equals zero, then we use g log y instead. So let's first look at that transformation. So first I need to explain what is g. So g is the geometric mean of the y. So that is product i from 1 to n yi and then the nth root of this. So from this we see the nth root is only defined if this product is positive and to be on the safe side and not run into cases where it's sometimes defined and sometimes not, this transformation is only used for positive y. Same here, that exponent also is happier if y is positive unless lambda would be an integer, but that is a rather special case. So that's for positive y. So that is g. And just for reference, I want to explain a trick. Namely, we can write g as the exponential of the logarithm of this value. And using the rules for the logarithm, we can simplify that a bit. So we get exponential of 1 over n times logarithm of the product. And finally, the logarithm turns products into sums. So that is the exponential of 1 over n of sum i from 1 to n of log yi. And while this and that mathematically is the same thing, if you are actually going to compute a geometric mean, this is the way to go that is numerically much more stable. Because here, if the numbers are less than one and you multiply 100 of them, then you may very well reach a number which the computer numerically claims equals zero, even if mathematically it's not. And then, well, if you take the n square root, it's meant to get larger again, but once you have reached zero, zero to any power is zero. So then you lose some information and you don't have the problem here. If you take the logarithm, you get some negative number, but it will be like minus 10 or minus 100, nothing which reaches the boundaries of the computer's floating point representation. And then that's just taking the average over n such numbers and the average is a harmless operation. There is usually no danger of anything overflowing. And then you take the exponential of what is hopefully a reasonable number. So that thing is much less prone to problems with overflow or underflow of number representations in your computer. So if you ever compute a geometric mean, that's the way to go. Good, back to this formula. So G is a constant. And now if you look at that, you notice lambda is also constant. I mean, it's a parameter, but for fixed lambda, that is just dividing everything by a number. And for linear regression, that really is not important. If you divide by a number, just the corresponding regression coefficients are multiplied by the number and everything else is unchanged. And similarly, that minus one here, that's just subtracting a constant, which again does not do anything interesting when you do linear regression afterwards. It just changes the intercept by whatever you shifted the responses up or down. Good, so these terms here, they are not really relevant for what we are doing. So in spirit, what we should read here is really y lambda is y to the lambda. That's why it's called power transform or power transformation. We are taking powers of the data. Now the question is, why are these extra terms here? And the g, I have to admit, I'm not quite sure about. The explanation which you hear often is, it is so that y lambda has the same units as y. And I nearly agree with this. So if y is measured in 
meters and say lambda is 2, then y to the 2 would be square meters. And if we divide by 2, then it's still square meters. So that would be different units than y, which was meters. And that thing has a power 1 less. So if we divide by g to the lambda minus 1, that would be divided by meter. That would turn back our square meters back to meters. And then we are back to having the same units. And that sounds all nice and well, except, of course, once you subtract 1 here, that argument in my mind totally breaks down. But still, people do that, and I assume it is probably to make somehow, in a bit less formal way, the transformed values more comparable between different values of lambda. Good. This minus 1 here and the 1 over lambda, this I find easier to understand, namely that is for continuity. So. If we change lambda, that value changes. And there is this funny extra rule, if lambda equals 0, that's undefined, see, divided by lambda. And instead, we get to use a logarithm. And I can explain the reason for this. Namely, we need to think what happens for this thing if lambda approaches 0. And I'm going to show you it approaches that. So why lambda for lambda not equal to 0 is y to the lambda minus 1 divided by lambda, and then here we have the g to the 1 minus lambda, if I write it in the numerator, which I'm not worried about now. Let's look at that. y to the lambda, we can write similarly to what we just done, as x of log of y to the lambda, and then we get x of lambda times log y. Now we assume lambda is small, so close to zero. And we need to answer the question, what does e to the lambda log y do if lambda is close to zero? And that we can answer via Taylor approximation. So e to the x is approximately 1 plus x plus x squared over 2, and so on, as x goes to zero. That's what you get from Taylor approximation. That here is a straight line approximation, and if you want to be more pedantic, you can have a parabola and so on. We just need the straight line approximation, so we get that is approximately equal to 1 plus lambda log y. And now you see what's happening here. Namely, I subtract 1 divided by lambda, so what I get is y lambda is approximately equal to, well, I subtract the 1, I divide by lambda, so what I'm left over with is log y. And then the term here I need to just copy. If lambda equals 0, then we get g to the 1, so just g. And if we go back to the previous page, g times log y is indeed what is written here. So what we have just checked shows that it's consistent in the sense in the place where that is formally undefined, there is no real problem. It's just a problem with this formula, but not with the function. And if we fill in this value at the gap, then we get a continuous function. So that's very good. Great. So these transformations are really trying different powers of y. There is some trickery here, and there is a special rule about what happens at zero, but trying powers is what it's all about. Now the question is, what power is a good power? So we can choose any lambda here. I don't think even negative lambda are excluded technically. There may be a bad idea, but as far as the transformation is concerned, they are fine. Well, there is a rule to go with this. So first idea is we could do it like we did before and minimize the residual sum of squares. So we can just use r lambda is, as before, sum i from 1 to n. And then we do yi minus yi hat squared. And now the data has changed because we are transforming it. And then if we do the linear regression estimate with the transformed data, then we also get new fitted values. So that's the fitted values computed with these data. And that's the residual sum of squares for our transformed data. So what we can try is we can plot that thing as a function of lambda. So you can do lambda, r of lambda, and you can think a model is good if the residual sum of squares is small. So you could try this lambda. And in general, that's a good idea, but there is a bit of a risk of overfitting because we have already used this minimization procedure to find y hat. Also, there is noise in the system, so it may not be that we get the theoretical lambda if there is one. So you need to allow a bit of slack in both directions. 
And in the notes, I list for you a rule of thumb, which is actually phrased on that, on the y-axis, which gives you a value here, which is, if we that, call that r min, then that one is r min times one plus something. And the suggestion is to use that region where r is less than that critical value as a region of possible or plausible lambdas. And what you would do then is you should probably not go straight for the minimum, but you should use a simple value like one or one half or three quarters or something which you have a chance to interpret if it comes to it. And in the notes, I have a numerical example done using R. And there the setup is somehow that one is here and one half is there, or I forgot whether it was left or right of the minimum, but whatever one half lies in the interval and is close to the minimum, so there I just pick one half on the basis of it being simple. And that means taking the one half's power of the data, which means the square root of the data, which seems not entirely unreasonable, but there is no hard science. So that is a rule of thumb. And you need to just experiment, look at your diagnostic plots, and see how well it goes. Good. So that is what I want to tell you about the power transform here. And in the notes, I have an extensive example to that. So go to the notes and have a look to see how that is used in practice. So that was the power transform. And there is one more topic to come in this section, and this is different from what we've just done. Namely, there we will discuss how we can avoid problems caused by multicollinearity early on when we design our setup. So it's not transforming existing data, but it's one step earlier. Sometimes if we plan ahead early, we can avoid problems. But I'll explain all of that in the next video.